For about $99, you can purchase a DNA test that will tell you where your family is from. In fact, there's a whole industry developed to helping you discover your origins. And I think it's got to be based on the age-old question, where did I come from? Because that information and accompanying stories can provide direction, understanding, and if nothing else, it's all really interesting. A good place to start is with your parents. Because no matter your circumstances in life, how they met and what happened after could be one of the most important encounters in your past. Hello, and welcome to the YL Drop, Young Living's official podcast. My name is Jacob Young, your host. Young Living is the world leader in producing and distributing premium essential oils. This podcast will provide you with drops of information about Young Living, like stories, history, products, lots of little fun facts, and even more. And we're also going to give you an opportunity to get some free product. Stay tuned for that. In this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about my origin story by meeting my mom, the one and only Miss Mary Young, (laughs) the CEO and co-founder of Young Living Essential Oils. We're going to find out a bit about her past and get the scoop on how she met my dad. Obviously, if my parents didn't meet, I wouldn't be here right now. Uh, Where we are sitting would not exist. And so it's amazing to think that in the unlikely event of them never meeting up in life, uh, Young Living wouldn't be around here today, or at least in the state that it's in. So with that being said, you'll also get to learn a little bit about the company's origins. Welcome, Miss Mother Mary, to the podcast. What do you think? I think this is fabulous. My son, Jacob, thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for being here. For those of you who do not know, Miss Mary Young is the CEO and co-founder of Young Living Essential Oils, just like I said. And uh, with that, you know, we, you and I obviously know the background and the history with Young Living. I I, think I know it better uh, than you. Well, that's also (laughs) very true. You've been around a lot longer than I have. So tell me where you were born, your siblings, your family, a little bit of your growing up experiences, fun times, just a little background. Oh my goodness, we don't have that much time. (laughs) But actually, I'm the eldest of six children. You know all your aunts and uncles. Mm -hmm. And we lived very humbly. My father, your grandfather, was a chiropractor, and he only charged $5 a patient a visit because he wanted to help people and didn't think he should charge very much. Oh, wow. So you can imagine what kind of an income that was, but he was happy, and we just kind of did our thing. My mother, your grandmother, Mm -hmm. only got her first car when I was in high school. And before that, she and dad shared a car. Actually, dad only let her have the car on Fridays. (laughs) I don't know if you can even imagine something like that. No, I can't. (laughs) But that's how we grew up. Grew up in in Salt Lake City. I graduated from Skyline High School. I went to the University of Utah. And I wanted to be a singer. And in those days... Singing was considered to be something grand and glorious that you studied in Europe. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, my dream was to go to Europe. So at age 19, I left home and went to Europe. And so with going to Europe, you were intrigued with singing. And uh, for those of you who don't know, my mother is a very accomplished opera singer. Uh, She's been with the Utah Symphony, and she graduated from the School of... uh, Fine Arts in Vienna, right? Well, you're close. Okay. I'm, I, I don't remember the name word for <laughs> no, word. No, you, you weren't thought of then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to go to Vienna. So I found the teacher I wanted to study with. I sent her a letter. She responded. I, w- I made it to Wien. I auditioned. She accepted me. I became a student at the Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts. Mm-hmm. And I graduated in 1972. And... It was a glorious experience. Yeah. It was just glorious. I yeah. have three degrees, one in opera, one in lead and oratorio, and one in vocal song singing. I don't know how exactly how you translate it. <laughs> but that took me to many unusual places. I sang in a lot of little opera houses throughout Austria, had a lot of fun. My last performance was the role of Adela in Die Fledermaus in Baden by Wien. And, and I have no idea what that is. <laughs> no, it's just a little <laughs> town, a little city outside of Vienna with a very beautiful little opera house. Oh, okay. You know, it was very common throughout Europe. All the little 
Yeah. All the little cities had their little opera houses. Yeah. Well, when we went to Europe, you pointed out everywhere that you had been. You even yeah. you even took yeah. us to the dorm that you were staying at at the time and how yeah. you only knew how I think you said you only could afford oatmeal at the time yeah. and you ate oatmeal every single day while you were there. I did. And orange juice, right? You drank orange juice cuz buying water was not considered classy. No, well, no. I <laughs> I love the way you get all the stories mixed up. <laughs> It's just fascinating how you retell them. <laughs> no, but what the deal is, is when you went to eat out in a restaurant, uh-huh. it's very impolite to ask for water. Okay. I didn't have money mm-hmm. to eat, and so I just watched my friends eat. I was very careful about how I ate, uh-huh. and so I had my Hafeflöken, my oatmeal in the morning. Ha- Hafeflöken? Hafeflöken is Hafeflöken. the word for oatmeal in German. I love yes. it. And then at noon, I would buy my little piece of meat and cook my vegetables, and uh-huh. that's what I would have for dinner. And I didn't need anything in the evening because I, most of the time I was in the opera house or yeah. in some other theater. Yeah. So afterwards, it was the big deal. Everybody would go out and eat. Well, I couldn't spend any money just eating in a restaurant, and I couldn't order water. So I became accustomed to ordering hot lemonade, Heisa Citrona. And if I ordered hot lemonade, then the waiters were perfectly happy with me. And did you add ginger to your hot lemonade? Because no. you have lemonade with ginger sometimes to help with your yeah, voice well, after talking. Ginger's and... nice. I didn't have those kinds of... Gotcha. What should I say? Luxuries when luxuries. I lived in Vienna. <laughs> 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 no, it was very meager. Yeah. It was very, very meager. But I, I did things that I needed to do, and I didn't do things I didn't need to do. So with, with oatmeal... Um, one of the favorite stories that dad always told me is when you were first married, he had to teach you how to cook because he said you only knew how to cook oatmeal 17 different ways. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> dad was being funny with you. Come uh, on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but dad, I didn't know how to cook an omelet. Uh huh. And I'd watch dad, you know, he was such a fabulous oh, dad, cook. Dad was a great cook. <laughs> and I'd watch him and he, when he said, okay, Mary, you make the omelet this morning. I can't remember. For you. I panicked because I didn't know exactly <laughs> what to do. But I became a good omelet maker. Yeah, you do make some great <laughs> omelets, some great smoothies. So <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. I love it. Yeah. All right, well, let's take a 60-second ad break from here. And when we come back, we'll hear about how you and Dad met. <laughs> That's going to be fun. <laughs> All right, so talking about DNA and origin stories, right here we have a beautiful bottle of the Three Wise Men. If you don't already know the story, I'm, I'm sure you do. You can find it somewhere. But if you'd like this bottle on your desk, on your shelf, wherever you'd like it, please comment down below your favorite origin story and why you enjoy it. A random winner will be selected the following week Tuesday at 9 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Make sure to follow us on social media on Instagram, Facebook at DYL Drop. Winner will be chosen, selected, and we will message you. So hopefully this sits on your desk. Thanks. All right, we're back. So the big question, the grand question, <laughs> how did you meet dad? That's a very funny story. I was at the Salt Palace in mm-hmm. Salt Lake attending what they call Preparedness Expo. I don't think we have those anymore, but you know there was a lot of excitement about being prepared for the changing of the century. Nothing happened. Is this like an apocalypse preparedness? Yeah, or? No, that like oh, kind okay. of silliness. Okay. But I was there when a gentleman was running as an independent, mm-hmm. running for president of the United States, and I really liked him, and there were about 10,000 people there. Holy cow. And I was sitting in the bleachers listening to him speak. And at the end of his speech, he said, whatever you do, check out those oils. Thank you very much. <laughs> and walked off the stage. And I thought, my goodness, what is he talking about? What are oils? How odd. So I didn't give it too much thought. And I was just walking around. You know, there were ugh, people everywhere and so many booths. And I came across one of the aisles, and as I looked down, I could see the word essential oils. And there was this young teenager behind the table, and I walked up to him, and I said, so what are essential oils? And he gave me his spiel, and and then he looked over and pointed to Dad, and he said, well, Gary Young's standing over there in the aisle. Why don't you go ask him? So I walked over, and Dad had lost his voice because he'd been talking nonstop for three days. So I asked him my few questions, and he answered me, and I left. Now, 
this young boy had invited me to a meeting the next day, mm -hmm. which I couldn't go to. And I said, well, you know, if you ever come back, just give me a call. I was very nonchalant about it. Yeah. A month later, I got this call that there was another meeting. So I decided to go. And these people, I didn't know anybody. I sat at the back of the room just listening. But what I heard was so fascinating. I thought to myself, i got to find out who this guy, Gary Young, is. Who can do all these things that they're bragging about? <laughs> and I signed up with someone I didn't know. I was just put under somebody yeah. just because I wanted to buy the oils wholesale. And I bought a few and took them home with me. And I didn't really know anything. But then I heard Gary Young was coming back a month later. So I went to that meeting. Mm -hmm. Dad's up in front talking. Yeah. And what I noticed was that he talked really fast. Yeah. You know how we keep telling you to slow down? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that's how Dad was. He just talked so fast, but names, date, places. Th oh, my goodness, it was amazing. He knew so much, and he quoted scripture about essential oils. Mm -hmm. Well, I love the scriptures, and, and I love all those ancient writings and history, and it was fascinating. So... I've always had this attitude that people who are looking for truth recognize it when they hear it. Mm -hmm. I heard truth, and I wanted to know more. And, and I was in another business. I had a very successful business. And that's and from that business, you got your first car, which we yes. still have this day. Yes. It's nicknamed yeah. the tank because <laughs> as we're sitting at a stoplight, it just rattles and shakes well, and three, vibrates. It's a 300D, <laughs> and it's still really fast, and it's just the neatest little car, although I don't drive it anymore. <laughs> But it was a big thrill for me because I was driving a VW that I bought in a factory in Wolfsburg, Germany, uh, yes. and I shipped it home. And by the time I was introduced to Young Living, my little VW wouldn't go in reverse and it didn't have any heat. So I had to park it in mom and dad's driveway so that I could, in backwards, so I could push it out into the road. pop the clutch? Yeah, bec yeah oh that's my. what I would do. I'd pop the clutch because there the road went down and it was enough <laughs> in the incline oh that my. I could get it going and it wasn't that hard for me to push. So as soon as it got going, I'd hop in and <laughs> close the door and pop the clutch and it would start. So everywhere I went, I had to make sure that I always parked it in a place where I could pop where the clutch. Where you could go downhill. <laughs> oh my. That's, so that's I was kind of in need of a new car and in the winter time I drove with a blanket around my shoulders and I'd go to meetings and I'd park far out in the parking lot because I didn't want anybody to see me with a blanket around my shoulders yeah I mean it was just so ridiculous yeah but I didn't want anything to do with a network marketing business because I thought that that's how all the people at the top suck the money up from the little people at the bottom and I was one of those little people so I didn't like it yeah I got a five dollar check in the mail oh Oh, my goodness. Wow, $5. Yeah, I was pretty impressed. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, how did I get this? The next month, I got a $100 check. I thought, ooh, I better find out about this. So I, I remember it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting on my bed downstairs in Mom and Dad's house. Mm -hmm. And it was like 10 pages long, and I read through the policies and procedures, and I thought, oh, if I just restructure my organization and build a little bit differently, wow, maybe I could get myself a new car. So in exactly... I think it was exactly 11 months I qualified for this new car. It was very exciting. The, f the, f How can I say this? In the very beginning, my dream was to make $2,000 a month. And I thought if I had $2,000 a month, I could live happily the rest of my life. At the end of that year, I was making $10,000 a month. Oh, wow. And I thought I was in heaven. I had never seen that kind of money before. I just... I couldn't even describe how I felt. It was and so exciting. And this was the business before Young Living? And this was the business before Young Living. So naturally, I felt very successful. Mm -hmm. I bought my condo. It was paid for. Everything I had was paid for. But I didn't feel that the products were, I don't know how to say it. It just, it just didn't meet my needs. It didn't satisfy my need for truth and authenticity it didn't give me a mission and these products were with the company before you met dad right okay okay and so that's why when i heard about essential oils and i heard about the the foundation that they had and i heard dad talking about what essential oils could do for the human body 
I just had this overwhelming feeling that I was hearing truth. And I got really excited, and I thought, I have found another basket. I have found a place where I can really get excited, where I could really help people. Well, they had a terrible marketing plan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the meeting that I went to, I very loudly let it be known that I would never build a business in that in Young Living because <laughs> they had such a horrible marketing plan. Oh, no. Unbeknownst to me, I get this call. And it's from the office of Young Living telling me that Gary Young is going to Egypt and he has a layover in Salt Lake and he needs someone who would come and pick him up at the airport and take him to one of the camera places to get some batteries and to the bank to get some money. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. Come on, isn't there somebody else? Oh, no, everybody else working. And I said, oh, okay, so I'm driving out to the airport. I don't want to do this. Who's this scary young? I don't want to go. So I get to the airport and I pick up the white phone. You know, they don't do that nowadays. But they white, used, white it was called a white phone, and that's when you called. And Are those it, like the it, service it, phones? Yeah, or? it would go over the PA system. Oh. So he, we found each other, and actually he was quite entertaining and funny, and we had a really good conversation. That was very humorous. He, he was very humorous. So I drove him to the camera shop, and he got his batteries. I took him to the bank, and he got his money. And so he offered to take me to lunch at the Hilton. So we're sitting here eating, and... He offers me this job, and I started laughing. I said, job? I don't want a J-O-B. I'm financially <laughs> independent. And I said, tell you what, I'll help you. Because all of his people were former patients from, you know, the research facility that he had in Mexico, mm -hmm. and he didn't have any business builders. He didn't have anybody who really knew anything about marketing, and and I was very successful with what I had done. Yeah. And I had the personality to talk. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I'll help you. i never forget. We used to laugh over the literature because it was so ill-written and bad grammar. And it was just funny. Dad, Dad's grammar was pretty rough, pretty well, brutal. Well, da Dad grew up in the mountains. Yeah. He was so a mountain he, man. He had mountain dialect. He had mountain dialect. And it showed all the time. <laughs> yeah, and he's... He said, well, you start at the top of the page, and when you write, you put, and you get to the bottom, you put a period at the end. <laughs> That's what he used to say. No well, commas, no nothing? No, nothing. Oh, no. So try and figure out where the sentences end, where they begin, where the paragraphs are. Well, I started doing that with the literature. Mm -hmm. And I wrote what we called a, you know, what was a three-page trifold. Yeah. And it was the first piece of literature without any grammatical errors. I had a lot of people come up and thank me at some of the meetings. It was so hilarious. But Dad was really interesting in that he started asking me. And after we were married, he'd say things like, well, Mary, how do you say this? How do you say that? Yeah, he always wanted to improve. Yeah, he always wanted to improve. And he'd say, well, will you come and look at this and tell me if this is the right way? He was such a creative writer. Oh, yeah. His mind was so fascinating. And if he had had a really good education, he would have been the most magnificent writer. Yeah. So going back to all of that, dad offered you the J-O-B, even though you didn't want to take it, but you said you would help him. So with that help, describe to me what the typical week was after that. What do you mean? Well, how much more work was involved? Like, what all did you have to do? How were you? How did you help out? Well, it's really interesting because it seemed like when Dad and I started working together, we'd been together our whole lives. You just clicked. We just clicked. Yeah. It was amazing. He decided to move the whole operation, the whole business from Spokane to Salt Lake because Salt Lake was more of a business center and there was a lot more international travel, all those kinds of things. But I had been to Spokane. Grandma and I went up there and helped him pack and move everything out. That's another crazy story, <laughs> just getting to Utah. <laughs> we, we pulled in. If you can imagine, here's this little itty-bitty business. We had one truck, one trailer, and one of the smallest U-Haul trailers. And everything he possessed. Fit in that. Everything fit in those three pieces of moving equipment. Oh, my. It was amazing. 
And when we arrived, it was Thanksgiving Day, and Grandma had made Thanksgiving dinner for us. And Grandma's such a good cook. <laughs> and when we walked into the old dilapidated building of Riverton. Oh, this is when you moved this to Riverton. Is Riverton oh, yeah. goodness. <laughs> Dad was asleep in one of the chairs, and Mom was sitting there waiting for us. And when we walked in, everybody was so tired, nobody could eat her Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of the day. Oh, we all we all went to grandma's and went home to bed. <laughs> it was just craziness. Oh my. oh my gosh, it was crazy. But that's how it how it started in in Riverton and so then, you know, it started to really evolve mm-hmm. and he was talking. I mean, the stories in the beginning Oh my goodness. He tells how he would go out on the weekends and lecture. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Then on Monday morning, he would answer the phones, take the orders, go into the back room. And get ready to ship all the orders Package out. them up, yeah. ship them. And he would do that Monday through Thursday. Then Friday, he would put the phones, on. the answering machine on. Uh-huh. And then he'd go travel and do lectures, lectures. for Friday and Saturday and come home Sunday evening and to be ready, ready to, to fill answer. All the orders and in. he said, I would sit there hoping that there would be more than 10 phone calls during the day. <laughs> I mean, it was and really all, fun. And all of these labels, right? All the labels for the products were hand-drawn, everything hand-written. Was hand-written. Yeah. Everything was yeah. done by him. Yeah, and once a month, he would push all the furniture in the front room. And lay all the commissions and out. And lay all the orders out and, and oh calculate commissions on his calculator. Wow. <laughs> he was still doing that when he and I met. And it was just about that time that he'd found a computer company to start doing his commissions. To do all the commissions, commissions for him? Yeah. Oh, man. I bet that was a relief and a half for him. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> yes. But, I mean, that is really scratching it from the beginning. That's dedication. Yeah. And even that old Riverton building, oh, my goodness, when we walked through it. It was dilapidated. It was terrible. And, oh. We no. couldn't even figure out what went on in that building. There were so many strange <laughs> things but paranormal activity yeah well he called me and he said mary find me a real estate agent and find me a building i'll be in at nine o'clock so i picked him up at the airport at 9 p.m mm-hmm. it was dark when we drove out to riverton and we walked through the building with flashlights and he said with flashlights at nine o'clock at night yeah oh and he said goodness. mary this will work just fine he said i'll get a dumpster i'll have a dumpster delivered in the morning and then i've got to go back to spokane but maybe you and your mom can start Cleaning up. Well, yeah, thanks a lot, Gary. <laughs> but he, he said... Dad, you get... Dad always made do with what he had. Yeah. I mean, all the equipment that we have yeah. at the farms are 15, 20 years old, but they, 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 they were. were. They were. They were. We've, we don't... we've definitely upgraded we and we have upgraded. newer machines, yeah. but Dad yeah. just made it work. He did. And, the... and he could do everything himself. Oh, yeah. I, rem- I remember he said, um, I've got to leave. I'll be back at the end of the week. So... Grandma and I were out there. He had the big dumpster delivered. He told me to go sign the lease, which I did. Uh-huh. And we hauled the junk out, and we hauled it out, and we hauled it out. Oh, my goodness. And we cleaned, and we scrubbed. Oh, it was just amazing. And then when Dad came, he got a grinder for the floor. He he bought the wood, the paint. He put up the two befores. He built his lab. He did it all himself. I love the story of how you and Dad met and how you became his assistant without really becoming his assistant in a way <laughs> and just helping him out. One of my other favorite stories yes. that dad told me yes, I can is wait. when you were in St. Mary's yes. and you uh, got invited to go with him to France and you said no. <laughs> so dad said, why not? And you said, well, that would be inappropriate because we're not married yet. And dad said, okay, well, let's get married and propose to you in the lavender fields. <laughs> well. So... I know dad's side of the story. I know a lot of you have heard that side of the story. So I'm going to let you share your side of this story as I want to hear this side because I don't think I've ever heard it before. You're too funny. (laughs) Well, I I made this agreement with dad and we decided to become partners. So he would go traveling and I ran the business. So that's how that all started. Uh Uh-huh. And that's how I handled the business in Riverton. But he was in St. Mary's. And this is where the St. Mary's farm began, the whole seed to seal experience. Yeah. 
because he had brought seed home from France, yeah. planted in, in the back behind the old building, his headquarters in Spokane, and it grew so well, and he harvested it two years instead of three years after growing. Yeah. And the oil was so fantastic, the two or three little drops that he got, and he'd sent them to Kurt Schnaubelt, and Kurt had said, where'd you get this? And he said, well, I distilled it from my lavender plants growing in my backyard. And he said, no, yeah, and that's... Kurt didn't, and Kurt he didn't, didn't believe, believe him. him. For those of you who don't know who Kurt Schnellbolt is, we will touch up on that as well as Provence, France, where this lavender came from. And so stay tuned for that episode. Yeah, I mean, there's story after story after story. Yeah. So anyway... He finally decided, when Kurt said that it was wonderful, he knew that he was going to have a farm. So the story of even finding the St. Mary's Farm is interesting in and of itself, but it's in a little valley in the Benoit. It's in a beautiful little spot. It's beautiful, yeah. surrounded by mountains, mm -hmm. and the only thing that it had ever been used for was for grazing cattle. Yeah. So there were no chemical no chemicals. Yeah. The ground was hard as a rock. Yeah. And it was just nutrient rich is what dad said. Well, he had to put a lot into but it no, and turn the... Yeah, that's he, right. He did. He put a lot of nutrients into the soil, Yeah, but he turned it and he turned it and he kept working the land. But then he decided he had to build a distillery because, you know, he built his first little one out of two pressure cookers that he welded together yep. and cooked that first lavender which is down, down in, the, in the kitchen. Which is down in the museum. Well, that was the, I think that was the third distillery. The third one, yeah. We don't actually have the two pressure cookers. So anyway, I was going up to St. Mary's and Aunt Karma and Uncle Jack were the ones who were running the farm. Mm -hmm. So I stayed in the farmhouse with Aunt Karma and Uncle Jack, and Dad was sleeping in a trailer that he bought with all the farm employees. So we would have dinner with Uncle Jack and Aunt Karma mm -hmm. every evening. On, on my dad's side. Yeah. On Gary's side. Yeah. And, well, everybody knows about Aunt Karma and Uncle Jack. Their, oh, yeah. Their pictures are all in the book and everything, mm -hmm. and they were a wonderful part of the beginning of the farm. So after dinner, Dad said, well, I'm going to go out and check my lavender field. You want to come with? So I hopped up and, you know, it's like 30 seconds from the house out to the field, which was lovely. And it was just a beautiful time of night. And we were standing up against the fence post looking out at the lavender. Ooh, I, 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 I see the romantic scene already. Well, we're standing there. It's about, I would say, summertime. It was probably close to 730 at night. Mm-hmm. And we had sunshine till, you know, maybe 10 o'clock. Yeah. And the sun was like on the, the top of the trees. So this was just the perfect romantic sunset. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just it, it was set up perfectly. So dad's kind of hemming and hawing. And he said, Mary, I'd really like you to take, I'd really like to take you to France with me. Because, you know, I'm, I'm attending this seminar on uh, essential oils. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> he said, I'd really like you to go with me, and then I could show you all the the fields, the, the lavender farms, the distilleries, and everything where I learned how to distill. Yeah. And I said, so when is this? And he said, well, I, he says it's about the 7th of September. And this was in July. And I said, well, I... I there's no way I can go with you. And he said, why? And I said, Gary, we're not married. What do you think everybody's going to say? And he says, well, they're talking already. And I said, well, I don't want to give him something really <laughs> definite to talk about. And he started laughing. And I said, well, I, I just, I, I won't go with you unless we're married. And so that's where everybody <laughs> says that I asked dad to marry me. It's not really true because we had kind of sort of talked about it for a Kind of, sort of, a long time. Yeah. But we never really... But you finally gave him the ultimatum. Yeah, that was basically the ultimatum. I'm not going with you unless we <laughs> get married. And he said, okay, well, then let's get married. I think that's a pretty good ultimatum. I mean, I'm happy with it, obviously, <laughs> so... <laughs> so it was a scramble. Uh-huh. We got married on September 2nd, 2nd, 1994. And we left the morning of the 3rd. We had to be to the airport at 7 a.m. And we had a snake line at the reception center up in Salt Lake 
because nobody believed that we really got married. And then there was the story that <laughs> your family couldn't believe that you were marrying dad. So no, I, this is how I, it goes. I remember it this way. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I remember it that your family thought that you were marrying dad for his money when in fact dad had no money. And <laughs> dad's family thought that dad was marrying you for your money when you didn't have money either. Well, I had, I did have some money in some the money. bank. Some money, okay. But I didn't spend it, and I, I no nobody knew I had much money. You've always been very frugal with yes, your money. Yes, that's right. You're I still save it for frugal. a rainy day. You're still frugal with and your I money. I am. I'll die being frugal. <laughs> but anyway, that was what people said, and your dad and I used to laugh and laugh <laughs> and laugh. But he was he was the brains. He was the genius. Yeah. He was the visionary. You know, I I was his gopher, I, and I loved following him around and. His brain was so fascinating. Hold off on that really quick. We're going to skip to a quick 60-second ad break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Hey, Droppers. After a full day of working hard, supporting friends and family, and keeping life running smoothly, protectors need powerhouse products. With the Dewdrop Essentials Collection, you and your loved ones can enjoy a complimentary Dewdrop diffuser to infuse your workspace or private den. You'll also receive four universally appealing essential oils, Idaho Blue Spruce and Northern Lights Black Spruce to remind them of outdoor adventures, and peppermint to keep their senses sharp, and lemon because, well, who doesn't like lemon? This limited time offer Father's Day collection is available starting June 1st at 12.01 a.m. Mountain Standard Time and goes till June 13th at 11.59 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And this kit is ideal for macho men, redefined gentlemen, or anyone male or female who adores diffusing essential oils. To check out this kit and this limited time offer, please click on the link down below in the description for those of you watching on YouTube. And if you're not watching on YouTube, well, better head over there. All right, welcome back. So, Mom, um, <laughs> I've watched you and Dad work together side by side, well, my entire life. And uh, I kind of just want to get your opinion on what you think made you and dad such a great team. And I know it's not just going to be one answer. It's going to be multiple. But I'd love to get a little bit of insight like that so people know just how you and dad were such a power couple is what people <laughs> said. The bottom line is that I believed in dad 100%. Yep. I was always there for him. I was always there to help him. Mm hmm I felt like it was my job to make his life easier so he could do what he did best. His mission was to take essential oils to the world. Correct. And so I helped him do that. And we thought so much alike. He was ahead of me on a lot of things. And I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot about energies and how to fill things and, you know, connecting to the unseen and it was it was fun. Yeah, I, it it opened my mind to s so much more. But I could I could do everything with him. We went everywhere together. I was with him when he <laughs> cut trees down. I was with him when he <laughs> built St. Mary's. I was there when the first steam came out, and you could hear him and Uncle Jack yelling and Just screaming. screaming at the top yep. of their lungs. It was. It was so exciting. What he didn't think about was that when the steam went through the PVC pipe, <laughs> it heated the PVC pipe, and the next morning when he went down to crank the boiler up again, the PVC pipe had collapsed and stuck together. <laughs> Ooh, that's not good. <laughs> so off he went into Spokane to get stainless steel. Yeah. And, but and he was frustrated because he didn't, <laughs> he didn't think about that. He yeah. should have known it, but he wasn't thinking about it. You and dad are like the perfect example of yin and yang, push <laughs> and pull. You know, you just, uh, you're the X to his Y, essentially. Mm -hmm. And just watching you and dad work together growing up, had, it set a perfect example. Because um, now I'm married and, you know, I know how to work alongside with Kate. And I just feel like you've, you've created such a perfect example to lead and follow by. 
you know, how to be there for your significant other, how to help them in any way that you can. And just being, being able to see how much you are able to accomplish by being such a good team together. I can, I'm, I can't wait for what Kate and I are able to (laughs) do once we are able to mesh our minds together. Right. Well, you're doing that now, but I have another unique personality trait. And that's that when I start something, I don't like to stop until I'm finished. Oh, I know. You don't like being disturbed while you're writing. (laughs) Well, yeah, but if there was uh, something to be cleaned, if there was something to be separated, if there was something to be organized, something to put on the shelves, Mm -hmm. no matter what it was, I didn't like to stop until it was done. And that's how dad was. Yeah. And so he never got frustrated with me that I wanted to quit. Yeah. I I wanted to push just like he did. I wanted to see it completed. I didn't want to stop until it was done. And that had to do with everything out in the fields, planting, yep. harvesting, distilling. It didn't matter what it was. And we just we just connected. It's like we've been together for eons. Yeah. I'm inspired by knowing just how the company started and the foundation and the integrity, the honesty, the commitment, um, the humble beginnings, the hard work, and the generosity, and you know everything, even with making money, Dad always gave back more than what he took. Always. Oh my goodness! The well, once again, thank you so much for coming on and just taking the time out of your day to talk about all of this. I think this is great information and knowledge, and just. So many fun stories to share with everybody that not a lot of people know about. It's a beginning. It's a history that no one else has. Nobody would do what your dad chose it's, to do for helping other people. It's, it's almost, it's, it's like a superhero story. Yeah, That's the is. best way that I can describe it. And well, it's exciting to be part of it. <laughs> that it is. And I'm super grateful to be part of it. Well, with that being said, thank you all so much for watching and listening. This is Jacob Young with Wild Drop. Don't forget to oil up. This is Jacob Young, dropping out. Take care.